that the devil is currently deceiving the entire world. But over in Revelation 20, verse 6, where is it? Revelation 20, verse 4, 5, 6, it says the devil is bound so that he can, he can deceive the nations no longer. Now, does it take rocket science or brilliance, you know, degrees in English to understand those couldn't be at the same time? You see that? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're a pre-mill by instinct, aren't you? I mean, you understand the pre-mill came in the future. I think you would. But there's a whole group, the Church of Christ, the millennial people say, oh, no, no, the Satan has been bound at the cross. That comes from Augustine. That's just incredible to me. This is an aha moment for me 50 years ago, getting off the tube train in London. I thought, I've got to, I've got to work out this pre-mill, a-mill thing. How does this work? And I can remember that moment. You have aha moments too, don't you? When things seem to become living and true. I thought, you cannot have Robin Todd looking at that piece of paper and not looking at that piece of paper at the same time. That's just contradiction. My point here is that the world seems to be very very vague in, when it comes to Bible. So our point of view at the conference, and, and I think it should be standard philosophy for all of us, is that we are servants of others. We're not, we're no big deal. God in his grace has given us the degree of truth that we have. But we are servants of others, are we not? To help them rejoice in reading the Bible, which as a child I didn't read. In the Church of England, I never read. I'm having fun with this book now. I want others to share that. And then if you could teach people, for instance, in the Proverbs, children are to make the one who bore them rejoice. Whoa, that rocket science? You know, you say about your child, isn't that thrilling to have this child? It doesn't seem to work that way. Okay. You're, you're going to have stable marriages. You're going to have people who don't sleep out on marriage. I mean, this is going to happen in the kingdom, but it should happen in advance of that among us. So that's our, our basic policy. Okay, a couple of things then before we uh, do a bit more with our circle chart. That one I gave you last, last week, the thing on the immortality plan. I've got an extra copy here or so. For our visitors, I think. Um, before that, I mentioned two things yesterday, last week, and one was there's a text on Ethiopia, that I thought our Ethiopian friend That's in Psalm 68, verse 29. Psalm 68, verse 24. I'm reading from the New American Standard updated version with marginal reference. As good a version as any. Look at, look at this. They have seen your procession, O God, the procession of my God and my King into the sanctuary. So you're watching a procession here into the sanctuary. The singers went on, the musicians after them, in the midst of the maidens beating tambourines. I like that. You know, isn't, that isn't that fun? Someone is celebrating in March into the temple. Bless God in the congregation, even Yahweh, you who are of the fountain of Israel. There, there's Benjamin, the youngest, ruling them. The princes of Judah are there in their throng. The princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength. Show yourself strong, O God, that's an appeal to God, obviously, who have acted on our Israel's behalf here, all these people. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring gifts to you. Here's then for the bad guys. Rebuke the beasts in the reef, the herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples, trampling under, notice that, trampling underfoot the pieces of silver. He has scattered the people who delight in war, so they're in bad shape. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Then what? Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hands to God. That sounds like, like the kingdom has come, doesn't it? They're having a procession into the temple, the tribes are there, and Ethiopia gets the point. They will have learned that some amazing things happen in Jerusalem. What's going on here, right? The news gets to Ethiopia, oh God, save us, right? That's not true today, is it? If we go today, if we send you today, they're going to just say, you know, oh, we're all converted in that world. I don't think so. That is one of thousands of pictures of the kingdom, I think. And you, of course, will be involved in a messianic march, probably from the wilderness when Christ, probably when Christ comes back. He retires to the wilderness for 45 days, possibly. The rabbis say, Daniel 12, <clears throat> extra 30 days, extra 45 days, you know that. Perhaps that's where God, or through Jesus that is, assembles the theocratic kingdom. Says to grace, well done grace, 
I want you to take charge of this. I want you to do this. Get the whole thing together. And then, now let's march into Jerusalem, take over from the Antichrist. So maybe, all the, this is a little speculative, but I didn't invent this. This is all in the theocratic kingdom of our Lord and Savior by Peters, if you ever want to buy secondhand three volumes. <coughs> the theocratic kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by a Lutheran, actually, called Peters, P-E-T-E-R-S. Three volumes, he goes into some of this. On the basis that the rabbis felt that the Messiah, when he arrives, will not appear publicly initially, but go into the wilderness and then march in and take over from the Antichrist. In that case, if you've got Jerusalem on, on a mountain there, he's not coming, putting his feet plainly there initially. He might be marching up onto it. This is, you know, it's possible. I, I'm not making this a denominational requirement. You, know, you can't be baptized, you believe all this. That, that's silly. But that looks like the picture, and Sean's very good. Sean Finnegan's very good on this, too. You know the thing in the highway in, in Isaiah 40, mm -hmm. prepare ye way, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds like the highway is being built for the Messiah to come in. All of which is to say that this is very much more real, is it not, than going to heaven when you die? I mean, if you really wanted to spoil the Bible, you say, well, the object of all this is play out of the pink cloud as a disembodied soul. What? A disembodied soul? I don't think so. You're experiencing everything through your senses. Let's take your body away. You're a disembodied soul. You're playing harps. Come on. That doesn't sound right to me. And, of course, I always have to add this. This is not boring doctrine to argue about. This is the life that you're experiencing. Look at that in, on the circle chart moment. As I understand it, truth and the words of Jesus, the words of the Bible, are life-giving, even health-giving. Right? So it's not some boring stuff that we do because we can't think of anything else to do. If this isn't relevant to your congregation, I'm seeing all of you here, you know, if the age goes on, you're all going to be supervising people in some form. What are you going to say to them when they assemble on Sunday, Resurrection Day Sunday? What are you going to say to them? You'll be good. I want you to be good. You've got to be better. You've got to be good. Well, that's, that's fine. Have a good marriage. You know, all that's essential. But if they don't have the framework of the picture and the plan, I, I think then they're being short-changed. Okay, so that's the text about Ethiopia stretching forth her hands. And then, of course, in your notes, you have Isaiah 19 speaks of, Blessed are my people Israel, blessed be my people Egypt, and blessed be my people, who's the third one? Assyria. Isaiah 19. Assyria. Assyria. That's amazing. Assyria. Yeah, Assyria. So that's not true today. I don't think you could say, Blessed be my people Assyria. The Kurds, probably. I mean, it's not. Okay, so. All of that is God's great plan. So you dream with God, right? Joe's phrase, get on board. What, what's God doing? That's a good place to be. God is announcing his dream through Jesus, maybe, and the kingdom. I'd like to be on that kind of a platform. Okay, we have some guests with us today, so I, I wanted them to maybe say just a couple of words if they'd like to. They don't have to now, but we're very... Well, I just introduced myself as Kifa. And yes, Kifa. Met Anthony uh, years ago. It's been a pleasure to learn. Yeah. Quite a bit from him. He's been um, a blessing in my life. So. Well, thank you. And you're from which state? Michigan, Chesterfield. Right. You want to say what sort of a background you came out of? Just very uh, JW background. Right. Many years? Yeah, second generation. Wow. wow. So I'm going, gained quite a bit of knowledge from them, from my father. And my of mother, course. So. Gave enough. up the Jesus is angel idea. So I'm you no gave that up. Yes. Correct. Yes. I'm no longer an Aryan, so. Tell us in what the, the official Jehovah's Witness view on Jesus is, <clears throat> that Jesus was. Michael, in his pre-existence, came to earth as a man, then went back to heaven and became Michael again. I didn't find that plausible. I don't think the Bible teaches that. Thank you. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's what they believe, that he's, he's still Michael. So he stopped being Michael <laughs> for 30 years, is that it? 33 years, and then went back to being Michael. Yes. So it's awfully difficult, isn't it? Yes, yes. This is difficult doctrine to uphold. So, and they know that too. They, a lot of them say, "Well, he's some other kind of angel. Maybe he's Gabriel or something okay. like that." Because Gabriel was there at the Annunciation. So, it just. Um, so you bring them Hebrews one, three and thirteen. To which of the angels did God ever, ever, ever say, "You're my son. Today I've begotten you," implying the womb, right? To be begotten is to start in the womb of your mother, which is a good place for human beings to start. Yes. 
It's frightfully complicated to explain how Michael stopped being Michael, turned himself into a fetus. <laughs> Justin Martyr even says that he overshadowed Mary, engineering his own conception. I'm glad I didn't have to teach that. You're smiling, but that's the official view. And that's yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> Is yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting because there is um, two different opinions on that. Some can't figure out if he ceased to exist before he entered the womb, yes, or was it some type of transformation in, into Mary? So they're, they're kind of reading back John into into Luke. That's right. They're, you know, they're, that's, it's a reading back, kind of like what they do in verse fourteen, reading Jesus back into the prologue. That's right. That's right. That's, that's the whole thing that you're up against. And I've said to Grace before, she wasn't brought up in that tradition, but she's been very civil and very kind. She's not shaking her fist. and She'll go in and think about this. That's all you can do. For me, this makes beautiful sense, although we had to be sat down and said, now, come on, Anthony, this pre-existing God, the Son, you've got in your system. I said, sure. And I never taught him those years. No, I never taught Bible at all, all of those years. But this pre-existing son, they said, well, no. The son began, his begotten, came into existence in the womb, rather than a transformation, which is a different concept. So it sounds funny when we say that Justin Martyr actually says this. When he reads 135, Justin Martyr, second century, when he reads Luke 135, that the power of the Spirit of God will come over Mary. Therefore, the child to be begotten will be the Son of God. He reads that to mean that the pre-existing son and the Holy Spirit are creating that event, which is very odd for Jesus to be able to engineer his own conception, you see? We went through this actually two years, not two years, two weeks ago, I think, it might be the week you were away. The, the scheme is very easy to figure out. You've got a distant, in Greek theology, you've got a distant God. Imagine God so far away, you can't deal with him, right? That's Greek theology. They did believe in the one God. They were Unitarians. They knew there was a single God, but he's so distant, you can't contact him. So what you need then is a series of lesser, this is the big God in Greek theology. And then you have various stages down to here where you get to man. And they had eight or three various Gnostic systems. It's very easy if you've been trained in philosophy as Justin Martyr, second century, one of the writers we have a lot of stuff. We've got a whole dialogue with Trifo. We just know a lot of what he said. It's very easy for him learning about Jesus to say, as the son, oh, okay, then he must have pre-existed as one. Let's say this is, this is actually the Greek system, this is Justin's system, J.M., just a single intermediary between the distant God and man. And that is the son of God pre-existing. Did you believe that the uh, son of God pre-existing was... God himself, or I no? Himself uh, no, or that's it's in stages. They didn't come up with the Trinity until three hundred twenty-five. Three eighty-one, three twenty-five. They, they exactly three eighty-one. They really the make it. Right. It's yeah. more. It's more like Jesus. Yeah. It's Jesus. Yes. Oh, because I was just reading a book on anti nicene history. Yeah. And I didn't understand exactly what Justin was trying to. Justin say has was. this statement: Sometime before Genesis. God begat a son, right? brought him into existence. So it's not Trinitarianism. Trinitarianism, and the, by the way, these are very easy concepts compared with being a technician. You know, very complicated. This is not very hard if you, if you think about it. Trinitarianism says there are three persons who are all co-equally God, each one. Three eternally existing persons. We're not there till 381, even 425, right? It's a long development. Hmm. But before that, you've got Justin Martyr saying there is the one God, and this one is begotten before Genesis, however, right? So he's not God, but he's the Son of God before Genesis 1. And eventually that Son of God decides to be man. The same, does he ever talk about the essence of the Son of God? Or no, he doesn't use the word usia, essence. He's a JW, really. See that? Yeah, he, he does actually, uh, he doesn't talk about the essence, you're correct. Right, right, right. He does subject the sons, if you, I don't know if you want to say deity yes. or whatever, to the father. He does realize that there's a God, correct. Mm -hmm. Definitely support. Yeah. So he's a subordination. Yeah. Right. This is still the one God in, in JW system. So this is really what the JWs eventually came to. 
This is the Son of God pre-existing, but not as God. Now the JWs then said, this Son of God is actually Michael the Archangel. They were precise. Justin Martin doesn't say that. He says that God begat a son, he's, he's vague. He doesn't say Michael the Archangel. JWs made that more precise, and that only started there with Rutherford. <laughs> if you can handle this, there's seven million at your door. Their original founder was Russell. Russell did not say that the son was an angel. He just saw him as pre-existing and created. When Rutherford came along, he said, we well, need to be more precise. That archangel, Gabriel, was the one who was here, the Son of God, created sometime before Genesis. And he became a man. And, and you, you can work that if you take some of the John texts. You can, you can struggle with that. However, it's frightfully complicated to enter the womb from outside. You see how difficult that is? It's fearfully complicated. Then what sort of a being got a part man, part angel, part man, part God? And then they argued about this for thousands of years, hundreds of years. I was wondering, Anthony, have uh, anybody mentioned the fact that Justin Martyr offered several concessions, namely that um, there were those of his race who did not believe that Jesus preexisted, which would be um, very interesting considering the fact that Justin was aware of John's gospel. He quotes John's gospel. Yep. And yet he tells Trifo in this supposed dialogue yes. that he could not prove Jesus pre-existed. Would that not indicate that John's gospel would not be axiomatic as far as sure. indicating a literal pre-existence of Messiah? Yeah, I think that's right. This is the work by Justin. You can read all this online when you've got nothing. Well, it's, it's fun to, to get into something. Uh, Justin Martyr wrote a long piece called Dialogue with Trifo and saw several apologies where he describes the faith. And he was making this point that in this work, Trifo is a Jew, and Justin is a, is a Christian. He's talking to a Jew. And the Jew says to him, I don't understand this pre-existent thing. I get the point that you believe that Jesus is Messiah, then I get it. But the Jew struggles with the idea of pre-existence. And then this fellow Justin Martyr, the Christian, makes a concession. He says, yes, there are Christians that are known to me who don't believe in the pre-existence of Jesus. Uh, that idea is there, but for him, being a philosopher, he needs to fill this blank here. The second God, you see. All of this has been well documented in Harnack, the historian Harnack. It's a long book with Harnack and his pupil, Luce, and many other scholars. Can't they? <clears throat> when when uh, Justin uh, used thought of the term begotten in yep. his head, yep. did he think of it literally as a, a moment that he was begotten or an emanation? Um, no, I think, I think a moment, but it's, bef it's before Genesis. Yeah. He begat in time. But it was actually begat at all, yes. in time. Yes. Okay. It's not into Trinity yet. It has to be eternal begetting. So another twist in this next stage of this thing, further than this idea, they eventually say, Jesus, the Son, was eternally begotten. You with me? He wasn't begotten in time, but he was eternally begotten. This is Origen, a very spacey philosophical guy. Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N. He's the first one who comes up with eternal generation. So you're, yeah, it makes no sense to many of us. But then the, the famous three church fathers developed that. I want, this is a church history class. Church fathers, uh, Gregory, two Gregories and, and uh, who's the other, Basil. They worked out the detail of this. The problem is, is this so far into the New Testament, right? And, and these people thought it was, but let me, let me reassure you. A lot of good scholarship finds this very problematic. They, they realize the difference. For example, the International Critical Commentary, you're aware of that, it's very famous. Doesn't mean all these guys are infallible, they weren't, but they were the best brains in the business. Doesn't mean they were good believers. I mean, I'm a naive believer. You guys, I, you know, the Bible says I believe it. They weren't of that street, but they had enough wit to see, for example, that Matthew and Mark and Luke had nothing at all about this. For Matthew and Luke, Jesus was begotten in the womb. That's quite clear. So you cannot argue the later developments into the Trinity. You can't argue them. From, now you may want to argue them from John and certain verses of Paul. I see that. But at least you, you, we can agree that it's not there in Matthew and Luke. So Matthew and Luke just left that out. That's 
International Critical Commentary, says precisely that. They say there's no <coughs> metaphysical sun, right? <laughs> Philosophical sun in Matthew and Luke. This isn't. Yeah. Well, the, the fact that Luke was kind of hanging out with Paul makes it yeah. Uh, interesting that he would omit something that would bolster messianic yeah. claims had that been something Absolutely. read as, as a literal pre-existence. So. I mean, yes, common sense would seem to dictate that Luke and, and Paul Charles together, we know they did. It probably didn't disagree on all this. So this puts us in an interesting position. Again, you don't, you're not forced in this college to believe anything. You, you check it out. And this is one of the beauties of the Abrahamic system. They, were, they would never said, you know, we're not going to even talk to you if you don't... Don't, don't need that. On the other hand, if, if this is useful and true and makes the Bible clear, then we have to, in a very gentle way, be the servants of the people, right? We're the servants. Not making money out of them, heaven forbid. You won't make any money in theology unless you do a bestseller, you know, then you might. But it's not a matter of uh, money. It's a matter of serving other human beings, helping them out. Okay, that's this rough sketch. Sean Finnegan can do the rest of that. Have you taken Sean's thing? You should do that. Sean's very good at it. It's going to give him the bob. It's what? It's going to give him the bob. Bob Jones is going to do it? Sean doesn't get to teach that? Teach that at all? <coughs> anyway, it would be good information. All right, that's that. Now then, we were on, uh, the, first of all, the, the, the final exam. This is what we're going to do. The final exam is on May the 11th, right? Two weeks from today. Yeah, two weeks today. We have nothing to do on May the 4th. It means you don't come at all. No, it doesn't. You must come. Uh, that's when we were going to do our speaking, oral presentations. Let's do it that way. I think that's what we talked about. Absolutely. That's a great know. idea. I don't think Grace wants to do the film. Grace yeah. had chosen, oh, and we, we're missing and our uh, SDA frame. We have to Anna Ababi. She only drives an hour and a half to get here. She fell asleep driving. Maybe she was raptured. Maybe she was raptured. Well, we all you know, missed it. Prove us all wrong. I'm right. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's let's do that then. On the fourth, our gentlemen in the class, him and him and two gentlemen. Wow, we have two ladies and two two gents. We do. So, would you like to hold forth on the kingdom of God as your final presentation on that day? Yeah, sure. What it frees, you know, it's this whole scope of life. Everything you do will be, I'll be seeing that. <laughs> yeah. Can hardly go wrong. So, but you want, to, well, of course, but you want it specifically on the king, because the king of God Yeah, last anything like that is a huge subject. I mean, if you come in and say you don't believe in the kingdom, you're an army, or you think the kingdom came at the cross and Satan's already been bound, then I'll put a <laughs> See me after class. <laughs> you're free to you're free to think what you want after you leave. Right. Class. right. Or you get your F minus for saying the devil's already been bound. I just think that's unreasonable. Okay. And uh, Grace is going to do. Uh, a, you're right. Absolutely. How, how long would you like this spoken presentation to be? What do you think? Guys, we have an hour and a half of I'm, I'm a bag of hot air. I can go for as long as you want. I think, I think until we get fall asleep, you know. It's mean, <laughs> very unlikely to happen. We'll have Keepo Flack Keepo in, especially. He can do one. <laughs> I, I would think. I mean, as long as you, you want to talk. 25 minutes. 20 minutes. Sure. Oh, four presentation, 20 minutes? Yeah. I've never had that in my life. What? Yeah. You, I thought I've you were 45 before. I, yeah. There's people you meet at work. Actually, yeah, it's fine. Whatever. Whatever's comfortable. With. I think you'll find it an absorbing subject. Yeah. I know you will. Okay, then that's uh, the, that part of it. What I will do on, on May the 11th is to give you 20 verses that you're supposed to know about. And I'm going to rehearse them right now. I'm going to ask you, and this is a preamble to the test. What great text in Acts, chapter and verse, was the banner headline text for the Restitution Herald put out by Abrahamic Kingdom believers? Page 12. Okay, you got it. Page 12, and the I'll ask oh, you these. Is this the final answer? This is, no, we're not oh, doing this. Oh, I, I give my final away, so you have a chance to ponder it. This is what you're supposed to know. 
Can you give the gist of what is said? That's number two. You can. You know what that is. I mean, if you haven't got Acts 8, 12, you're throwing away a very precious text. <coughs> number three would be, in which chapters of the book will you find Jesus' theology of salvation in his parable of the sower? You're supposed to say, no more four than eight. Matthew 13. Right, you're just hesitating there. You've got to know that. If you haven't got that, you aren't fit to graduate. Okay. <laughs> Uh, four. In which chapters do you find the Olivet Discourse? And if you say uh, Mark 20. 1, you're wrong. Matthew 21. Yeah, 20, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. You've got to know that. Number five. Can you list the eight kingdom texts in Acts? Why is this so important? It proves that Paul was preaching the same kingdom gospel as Jesus did. I and mean, this is just huge, folks. It's utterly huge. Because your friends out there, whose servants, as I said, we are, do not think, really, deep down, that the teaching of Jesus really matters. This only dawned on me in the last year or so. And I will give you a handout here to take away with you. But for example, James Kennedy of Coral Ridge Ministries says, Many people today think the essence of Christianity is Jesus' teachings, but that is not so. If you read the Apostle of Paul's letters, which make up most of the New Testament, you'll see there's almost nothing about the teaching of Jesus in them. This is what you're up against, based on that. Throughout the rest of the New Testament, there's very little reference to the teachings of Jesus. And in the Apostles' Creed, the most universally held Christian creed, there's no reference to the teaching of Jesus. This is what, you know, we're, we're doing the, what every general or admiral does. You face, you know, what are you, what are you facing here in order to serve these people? It's good to understand where they're coming. And then he says, there's also no reference in Paul's writings to the example of Jesus. Right? Only two days in the life of Jesus are mentioned. The day of his birth, the day of his death. Christianity's final statement centers not in the teaching of Jesus, but in the person of Jesus. As incarnate God who came into the world to take on himself our guilt and die in our place. That's what you're up to. This is a famous, famous loser. It's all, I'll give you this handout takeaway because it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. Now, I did add one little scurrilous thing from Luther. If you're a Lutheran, you should be aware of this. On one unusually angry occasion, Martin Luther said, if I had to baptize a Jew, I'd take him to the bridge of the river Elba, hang a stone around his neck and push him over with the words, I baptize you in the name of Abraham. Wow. Now that, admittedly, to soften it, <laughs> was a particular... He did baptize Jews. He did some. But one Jew that he baptized and then who sort of went back on the faith is what he said. So you have to be careful of that. Now Luther, on one occasion, said, the book of Revelation is not a Christian book. And also, the epistle of, of, of James is ein Strohbrief means a straw epistle. No good. All I'm saying to the public is be careful before you buy into the Lutheran system. Do you really want your mentor to say that the book of James is not a useful book or the Revelation? It's very strange. Isn't it? Anyway, so I'll, I'll give you copies of those. Stuff, okay? Next question. This is with Dr. Joe, we're doing the tests in advance. They're getting a chunk up. Oh, think about it so we can, we can make sure they have it learned by this time. Where in Luke would you begin to show the mission and purpose statement of Jesus? And the answer is, they all said, Four, Luke 443. <coughs> you preach that every Sunday at least five times until people go, then you hear them saying this out there, you know, and you know you've got it. They, they have to talk about it. But then you know you've got your congregation active. Where would you find chapter and book, the great Davidic covenant? Uh, Without the sense, second time and seven. Without the sense of purpose, which I think these people captured, I don't find the story interesting. It's the plot, to use the Megan term, the narrative, right? False or true narrative. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of the plot, aren't you? This makes sense of life. I mean, that's not, that's no small deal. Okay, so. Nine would be, where do you find the story of God's new start in Abraham? Uh, Twelve. Genesis 12. You, if you want to be flowery, showing off, you've got 13, 15, and 17, doesn't matter. Twelve is fine. 
God makes a brand new start of some dismal failures, right? Let me start with Abraham. So the idea of calling yourself Church of God Abrahamic faith is brilliant. I don't have words to say. It's huge. That's exactly right because and this one you should also know, Gal Galatians 3.8 says what? The gospel was preached ahead of time to Abraham. Brilliant, isn't it? It's absolutely staggeringly good. Okay. Uh, number 11, no, number 10 was this. Well, what I is Jesus first command? Yeah, right, I, I, think added, we, I think we missed one. Right, I, I added one that's not in here, so. Okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of this. In my number 10, what is Jesus first command in Mark 1? Repent and believe the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, right? Isn't that, isn't that clever? That's the command. You're supposed to believe it. But as long as your friends out here don't really think the teaching of Jesus matters that much, you're in bad trouble, aren't you? You've got really a reject a twisted Paul and a rejected Jesus. You've got to be simple about it. But that's, that's the problem. That's why Dr. Joe and I are, are, are in this movement, because this actually makes really good sense to me. If this isn't true, nothing's true. You can say the Bible is a fraud. I find that difficult to believe because I cannot think that Luke was drunk or trying to make money out of me. What was, it, what was his object or any other writer? Luke particularly was in 33% of the New Testament he wrote. What are they on about? What, what, what are they so excited about? I think it makes good sense. Okay, so that is then Mark 1, 14, 15, which says, repent, change your mind and believe the gospel of the human. Eleven was this. This, you might remember, how is Romans 10 misused, misused to truncate the gospel? Romans 10, we perhaps didn't do this as fully as we should, but in Romans 10, you've got a famous use of text here which omits all the king stuff that I'm not even dealt with. Romans chapter 10. Uh, 16, maybe? Yeah, what does it say there? However, they did not heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, uh, who has believed our report. So faith comes from hearing, and by hearing the word of Christ. Right. Faith, that's a brilliant one. Faith comes by hearing. How do you do the hearing? Messiah's word. The King James is wrong there. Not, not, not uh, just God, but the message of God, but Christ's gospel. That's the basic thing. How do I get my faith? Now tell me. Well, start by believing what Jesus says. You go from there. And what? Jesus says in Paul later. All right, so that's Romans 10. Uh, 12 is this one. Why do the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not mention being born again? Or do they? And on our circle chart, we'll do more of a moment. Of course they do. But it's under the image of a seed. The seed and the agricultural model is what Matthew, Mark, and Luke the born again is the image, the, the biological one, right? Being born again. I think we are genetically children of God. Then. And, they're, the and they're brought together, the two are brought together in First Peter, yes, is it? Yes, absolutely. That's brilliant. I've got this on the chart. I'm glad you mentioned that. The two are brought together in First Peter chapter 1, 22 and following, where he says, you have been born again, not of corruptible seed. Isn't that brilliant? Peter listened to Jesus for hours. He brings it together. The people say, oh, you're not born again. Oh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. No, no, wait a minute. Of course they knew about it, born again, but they're using a different image. Agricultural thing, farmers maybe, and fishermen. For the more sophisticated guy, Nicodemus, perhaps the more difficult idea, born again. Neither did. They're both together. So that's the point in that question. 13, can you mention two texts which stress obedience as necessary for true faith? Uh, he was one of Hebrews 5 9. Five, five. Romans Don't one, Absolutely good. Nine, 1 5 and five. 16 at the end. If you just got chapter 1, chapter 16 of Romans, that frames the book of Romans, doesn't it? Beautiful. But Hebrews 5 9, is, I, I like easy stuff. Isn't that great? Salvation is given to those who obey Jesus, period. So let's not argue about water baptism, right? We shouldn't have to argue about water baptism. It's in the Great Commission, right? A lot of people seem to think that when they say obey Jesus, they mean obey what he does, his actions, but not believe what he says. <laughs> right? <laughs> obey doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with 
believe in what he said. I don't even understand yeah. that. I mean, Joe has a certain amount of Abrahamic authority in our college. So really? then, That's what is this? Now, how does this work for Joe? I, if he gives us instructions, how does that work now? I, I'm to <coughs> believe what he says, but not do it. Is it? <laughs> right, I, the, you know, the brain just goes into fog mode. Yeah. But that's what you are facing out there. I know that. I speak with some passion. I'm doing this for some hours every day, and many of you are too. It's quite bewildering, you know, isn't it? Yes. Doesn't it leave you sometimes flummoxed? You know, how is this possible? Okay, um, which is the great resurrection chapter? First Corinthians 15. Which book tells us that the gospel is not not just a repeat of Moses? Which, which book? Galatians. Galatians. Hugely relevant to our time. The book of Galatians is impassioned, as it gets, isn't it? He even gets vulgar, right? If you want to get a certain guy, you want to chop it off, right? Yeah. I mean, he uses vulgarity, like Joe when he says, you know, H-E-L-L, no. <laughs> and not, not a fair comparison. But he also uses very strong language. You idiots! Come on now! I can imagine Paul's voice. You fools, right? As Bill Wattell used to say, if Paul is preaching a different gospel than Jesus, Paul is putting himself under his own curse. Right? You get it? Oh, we're, not, we're not kidding you. It's, it's anathema. If you're going to water down the gospel, get it wrong. Not preach it fully, you're an athlete, very strong man. I guess it, I try to figure God out all the time. God must be, he's very compassionate, I understand it, he's been very merciful to all of us, but he wants it done right eventually, is that right? He's not messing around. You want to have sex, do it in marriage. You're out, I'll, you can persist in sex out the night, forget it, you're not going to be there. People don't find that easy to take. And I think aborting children is a bad idea. My wife's done a lot of work on abortion, she's been presented on at the conference, it's really sad. It's a very cruel idea to say, well, I've got a baby in my womb. Let's kill it. Let's pull the dog loose. Come on, folks. That's not going to work. So you, then you do the, the, the worst text of all. Bring my enemies in front of me, the ones who didn't want me to reign over them, and execute them. That's Jeffrey's. Yeah. Which, of course, is a terrific... I've got this on the test. Okay, so which book tells the gospel not just to repeat of Moses, Answer Galatians, which we didn't understand. I didn't for 14 years. I struggled, they would nearly died trying to do Galatians wrongly. Right? You guys are so blessed to have this information. So don't join the Sabbath keeping group. <laughs> Deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what can you say about the abomination of desolation? Well, you can say it's in Matthew 24, uh, verse 15, and you can refer to Daniel. Big muddle about that, right? Big chaos. No need for because it's key for Jesus. When you see the AFD standing where he, where he, where he, where he ought not to be, then head to the hills. That's one of the keys. 17. Why is seed such an essential factor in our gaining immortality? Well, I suppose the answer to that is everything's from seed, isn't it? Everything that we know of arises from seed. You're all seeds. Isn't that amazing? Why not then the immortality scheme from a seed? The seed of the incorruptible gospel. 18. What do you understand to be the mistake in C.S. Lewis's statement? The gospel is not in the gospels. That's what you're asking. Or Billy Graham. What? Jesus came to do three days' work. Right? Those two statements. What book did he write that in? Or That's in the introduction to the J.B. Phillips translation. A paraphrase. Very nice paraphrase by J.B. Phillips with the introduction by C.S. Lewis. The gospel is not in the gospel. It's in Paul. So many of your friends out here have been told that Paul really invented the gospel. Well, I see that Paul developed a lot of stuff that Jesus said you couldn't handle. I see that. But Paul would be the last to say he invented the gospel. We should have had Hebrews 2, 3 on there, which says that the Lord was the first one to pronounce salvation, Lord Jesus, right? Hebrews 2, 3. Hebrews is a fantastic book. I mean, they're all fantastic, but it's very intense. Hebrews 2, 3. I haven't got that on. It doesn't matter. It's a good one to have. Okay, so the Billy Graham says, Jesus came to do three days' work. To die, to be buried, and to be raised. That's an tract in 26 languages all over the world. Now, I'm sure if you question him, he'd probably do better than that, but that's a bit misleading for these dear people. 
follow Jesus. What was he doing? He was sitting there gazing into the sky for his ministry. But, and then he, then he gets up to get to die. No, it's just not. 19. What is your favorite kingdom verse? And I'm right, you know, so and so. Hopefully it'll have kingdom in it somewhere. <laughs> and uh, we can write as much as we have time to. And finally, what do you hope for yourself and the world in the coming kingdom? And don't say, if I could just hold the door for a thousand years. Don't put that, as I'll mark that as F minus. <laughs> God is more excited about your talent sometimes than we are, right? It's good to be suitably humble. I see that. Well done, Jesus. I get that. Well, what about well done you? Right? Don't hear much preaching on that, do you? That's an important part of our scheme. Okay, so that's it. Now if you take that little uh, chart that we had, if you still have it, you do, call it uh, the uh, circle chart, immortality plan. Here's a slightly revised version. We have another copy. Okay, I've altered one, two, three. You can't go through all this, but we'll take a break in just a moment. Come back. Let me just introduce this and we'll have a break. Okay, the point here then is I think the scheme as we've been outlining it. You've got all the verses you need here uh, to cover the subject. This would probably take six months to a year to preach through this. At least. It's a lot of talking. Paul spoke what, from dawn till dusk for three years, two years. It's a lot of teaching. I think you have to do it. So it's the immortality plan, how to gain indestructible life from the sea. That's Luke 8.11, which is fantastic, by the way. It says the sea is the gospel of the kingdom, the word of God. Right? So you must define the sea. The seed is the kingdom of God. First Peter 1.23, the one that Robin excellently marked. Mention. Let's go over there, let's be 123. To locate how Peter then joins the seed with the gospel with the born again. So, first Peter 1, we have this. We can start in verse 22. And you'll see all of the themes that we keep mentioning coming along. Since you have in obedience to the truth, the gospel. Are you prepared to go? You made a good start. Pur you purified your, your souls, yourselves. <clears throat> For a genuine love of the brothers. Note that which, which comes first here? It's not you've got to be loving, you've got to love your brothers. Yes, that's very important. But you're not going to be able to achieve this if you haven't started with the seed. So you have not been born again. In our Armstrong days, we said, no, you can't be born again until the resurrection. That's false. That caused the numbers to come out. It's just wrong. Cleverly, we were only in the fetal stage, you see, under control of Armstrong. We were little fetuses, couldn't do nothing in the womb. That's false. Having been born, again, that's past tense. You are born again. Where did you get it from? Not a seed which is perishable, but immortal seed, if you like. Imperishable seed. That's to say, through the living, and enduring gospel of God, kingdom of God, gospel word of God. That makes actually perfect sense. That God is creating immortals, isn't it? But he's doing it by an expressly uh, clear method, the see. Then he brings in a Bible verse, right? Good, good preaching model for you all. Brings in an Old Testament. Look, all the flesh is like grass, all the glory is flowering. Uh, is, is the flower of grass, sorry. Glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers flower falls off. I'm watching my native azaleas on the creek there. They bloom for one month. Now they're just blue. They're gorgeous, glorious, you know, smelling <coughs> sweet. And then, yeah. So you're supposed to observe that in your garden, your yards. Because you're living in a laboratory, it seems to me, in which God teaches all these lessons all the time. Is that right? Seed, I mean, we all know about seed. We all know about growing tomatoes. Barbara makes me do the planting side of <laughs> what I'm talking about here. It's not unrelated to practice. Therefore, no chapter breaks here. Therefore, putting aside all malice, all right, so we, we lay aside these bad things like malice, and all deceit, no lying and all that. Hypocrisy, very dangerous. And envy, shouldn't be envious of each other, and all slander. 
like newborn babies. I get it. That doesn't sound to me like in the womb, does it? I think we're out of the womb. Newborn babies. Now we've got to grow, right? That's just a start. Newborn babies. You're to long for the pure milk of the word, God's expression, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So it's a growth curve. Yes. In my Bible, in the margin, it says in verse 25, in verse 25, mm -hmm. but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached as good news to you. Absolutely. So, so that's right, huh? Absolutely right. We, I thought we hadn't got there yet. You passed by it, didn't you? I, thought. I shouldn't have. 25, I'm glad you... That's the Spirit moving among us. Oh, You'll notice that in Bible study, by the way, very often. I, I, I skipped it. Crazy. Verse 25. <laughs> but the Word of the Lord, the Gospel, lives forever. And it was this Word which was Gospeled to you. You see? Isn't that good? Not just preached. All preaching is preaching the Gospel. Not just preached. It's bad translation. It was evangelized to you. That's how you got started. So we must have that. No, so, okay, so then, therefore, in view of all that, Hollis Partner used to say, you always need to see what the therefore is there for, right? The logic of what follows. If it's a therefore, therefore, right? Putting aside all matters and so on, as newborn babes, verse 2, long desire the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow. That's interesting, isn't it? So without this word pulsating in, in your bloodstream, you're not going to grow. You just going to sit there and, and be static. If that is, you've tasted the kindness of the Lord, the Lord generally Jesus, as matter, Yahweh, or often with the article of Jesus, doesn't make any difference to other people fight over that. It's coming indistinguishably, indistinguishably from the Father or the Son. The Lord God, maybe, it doesn't matter. Coming to him, probably then, was it coming to God or Christ? Doesn't matter, you came to both. As a living stone, which has been, oh, okay, it's Jesus here, isn't it? Context tells us. Stone which has been rejected by men, but it's choice and precious in the sight of God. Okay, that context there sorted that out, isn't it? Coming to Jesus, a stone rejected by many. Okay. You also then, as living stones, now here's the image of the temple, you're being built up as the temple. You're being built up as a spiritual house holy priesthood, that's Exodus 19 all those Israel texts are now dumped on you right? most important, all those Israelite texts, you are really God's people God's true circumcision international, but you're God's prime concern then the bit about laying all of that and so on I mean you can read on, it's all good stuff but the point would be that that's the seed connecting the parable of the sower with Peter's born again and 1 John 3, 9, at the top, what does that one say? We found that last week. God's seed dwells in you. So John has it too. God's genetic seed, and whatever that is in terms of God, it's his personality in you through the word of the gospel of the king. I think. Okay, somebody read for me 2 Peter 1. Oh, no, I have a break. Have a break. So six minutes. Oh.